the first three weeks of the eruption here in Hawaii, crazy things would happen in the middle of the night. A new fissure would open up and it would threaten a new neighborhood. Thousands of people are evacuated from their homes. I started the Hawaii Tracker Facebook group to help people understand what's going on and get their questions answered. Hey, how's it going? We're live. This is Fissure 20. We had hundreds of people all throughout the neighborhoods sending in videos and articles and images. We spent a lot of time making sure the accurate information gets out. This is live, it's still lava moving. They weren't just sharing a story, they were helping their neighbor. If a family was being evacuated, my group would just jump in and help out. So it was huge. They were watching out for each other. Hello everybody, thank you for coming. Thank you for the support from everybody. As we go through this, we're growing closer together as a community. When tragedies like this strike, you really realize how much you need each other. Hello everybody, I am geologist Philip Ong. I'm here with Mr. Dane DuPont on behalf of HawaiiTracker.com bringing you guys another Kilauea Volcano update. Today on uh, February the 26th, 2021, the 68th day of this ongoing summit eruption. Past a two month milestone here by about, about a week or so. Um, Dane is going to be manning the chats, checking our streams, making sure everything everything's alright on air. And so uh, you guys are, are typing in a chat and wondering what Dane's doing over there. That's what he's doing is typing back to you guys and making sure you guys can get all the info you can in all manner possible. All right, so we'll jump into our update, which I'll narrate here today. Um, and we'll start off, you guys, with a, a, a zoom in on a thermal camera here, the F1 camera that uh, I've, I'm running here from um, February 23rd till today, so the last three days or so. And this is the most interesting thing that's happened in the last few days. Overall, not a whole lot has changed, but what we do have is this is the west vent entry point right over here, where the lava is pouring into the lava lake. But over here, there is that side upper north vent. You know, kind of it's 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 a uh, not quite at the top, but it's um, part way up the the cone, a lot higher than this entry you see down here, where it actually plunges into the lava lake. So it seems like this corresponds to an inflation part of the trend of the volcano. So when it was inflating, it would actually put out this little burst of a lava flow. You can kind of see in this thermal imagery, these warmer colors are the flow itself kind of going down the the edge here between a wall of the old Halemaumau crater, which is this dark part over here, and then this perched rim up here 
of the lava lake, which is active, right? And so this is this is spilling over from time to time. You see a couple overflows here, and then one actually spills over and meets this other overflowing hookah. But what we're talking about here is a spattering source that's flowing down over here in this north channel. That's the most interesting thing that happened in the last in the last few days here. And that corresponds with the pressure cycles on the volcano, which are also interesting. Um, we'll look at that here shortly. But focusing on this here to start, since it's you know, something we haven't seen quite as much. That's our view in the thermal camera, um, how it looks zoomed in. And because we're looking here from the west to the east, that's towards the east. Uh, maybe I should draw north arrow. North arrow would be that way. Um, we can actually see this gap between the backside of this west vent and this crater wall over here. So we actually can see this lava flow coming out and it's hidden from view underneath us, this puka right over here, this little depression right in there. But the flow actually goes down and around and comes out and goes as far over as somewhere right in here. It was a small flow and it, and it turned out that that pressure cycle didn't last long. Pressure increase didn't last long. It actually decreased shortly afterwards. And so maybe that's why it didn't last as long. But certainly as a, the, the pressures are lower and the flow is reduced, you may see some constriction of these passageways, you know, and maybe that's forcing lava to pop back out this upper crack of this weak cone um, as it repressurizes a little bit. Not that much, just a little bit. And, you know, just a few overflows kind of coinciding with that at the same time. So nothing major there, but small fluctuations and overall uh, decreasing trend of activity. Um, although the lava lake has still been active the entire time. Um, it does seem that the gas values are still low, although the most recent measurement has gone back up a little bit to 1,100 tons per day. That's kind of a quick recap there. I'll go through in a little more detail here. Um, that's the uh, zoomed in view from the west vent. Let's look at the S1 camera here next. So now we're looking from south to north. North is in that direction over there. And so the west vent's over here, kind of in the dark. You can see the entry point right over there. And you maybe can see these right edge here, these whitish spots or two glowing vents at the top of that cone. And over here, slightly to the right, that's that spot we're looking at right over there. Right, so I'm gonna play it here. That's that flow goes all the way to right in there from this point of view. You don't see it quite as soon and you don't see it um, as well because it's flowing down the back side of this cone over here and you can't quite see as well. Right, but there, there it goes again. You can kind of see it a little bit in daytime, a little bit in nighttime, and then it kind of just peters out. Whereas this lava lake surface uh, is much more active consistently. I'm going to have a zooming in and out here. So this is the, the zoomed in view and the zoomed out view, so you can kind of see where that fits within a pattern, the size of this whole crescent active lava lake and the island that's still here in the middle. So here now more zoomed in. That's a little bit, a little bit closer up. So it's 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 there. You don't see a whole lot from this point of view, but it is there. So here's our I'll play of you guys uh, just the last week or so uh, in a regular view of the time lapse over here. So this is we're up to February 18th now. You can kind of see mostly we're having this recirculation within this crescent of the lava lake, and a few of these lava flows coming up on the edge, whether they're being squeezed up by pressure um, or whether this lid of this crusted over lava plate on this eastern side is buoyant enough that it actually is just lifting more so and there's creating a gap and it's actually just rising because there's a gap is not quite clear to me but those are interesting interesting things to think about thanks for the question from our one of our viewers that is probing into that you can kind of see here we're still going um we're about four in the last four days now you can kind of see a little bit more of these islands emerging smaller closer ones to this west vent you can see a few over here on this more northern side as well. We were looking before at this kind of south bay and north bay as indicators of, of the flow, right? You can kind of see that as, as the pressure drops down, you see the activity there reduces, especially in this north bay, a little bit more in the south bay. And it actually comes back up again as the pressure increases. So, and in the meantime, we still have these little, little edge effects going on. And geologic time continually there. That's the view of it there. And I can kind of rewind a little bit so you can kind of see the view of these islands, right? This is the 19th I'm showing on the screen right now. You can kind of see there's one, two, three islands visible right there. If I quickly advance it forward here, you can see that somewhere right around right in here, that is the 22nd, afternoon of the 22nd. Starts to, to 
become all visible, all, a lot more of these islands. One, two, three, four, five, six. So that's the, the thermal, thermal view of the eruption. And here's the last 24 hours automatically generated by the USGS on their web page here. So this is all USGS Hawaiian Volcano Observatory uh, webcam images here. This is their automatic 24 hour capture. They have these images over here that they post uh, more frequently. And so we actually save these. One of our viewers, Bob Martin, does that. Mahalo, Bob. And saves all these. And we can assemble them into those time lapses and zoom into those little areas that we're showing you guys. So there's a little bit of bonus coverage on top of what USGS is bringing you guys right there. All right. So that's the, the F1 camera. And here is a visible view from the KW camera, which is also looking from the west. And maybe he's a little bit better at the backside of this, of this flow. But because I'm really zoomed in on it, you really don't have that great resolution in there. That's about as far as zoomed in as I can get because the original image is actually way out like that. But we can see that that's that same pattern of activity there. And that's why we rely on that thermal camera as our best best tool for this particular little, little lava flow that popped out in the last few days here. Started and stopped already all within, within two days there. But interesting nonetheless. All right, here's the S1 camera view from the south. And... And I see that the activity is all over now, not even any glow, anything over there anymore. And this other little cone over here, let's see if I can zoom in on that, is still glowing. It's kind of a lower glowing spot and an upper glowing spot, um, which is interesting. So maybe that's a spot that as pressure backs up, uh, maybe the lava starts coming out of here as well as down on this, this little plunge point, as we do imagine it going down and up in some manner because this lava lake surface has risen to cover it over the last uh, two months or so. All right, that's the S1 camera. So there have been a series of photographs released. We'll look at those here. And this is USGS uh, um, photo photograph page. This is going back to February 24th here. You can kind of see their view through their telephoto here of this upper vent. And this more silvery material is that active lava flow. It's kind of silvery, and the, the, the crust is maybe a little bit smoother because it's actually still very thin floating on that liquid. That's that flow pe peeking out the back, and maybe you see a little bit of a dribble over here in the front that we've been looking at over the last week a little bit as well. Right, That, that was kind of an area we are talking about, our intro pahoy hoy and the dribbles, and we had some signs that there was a pathway of lava over here, and there was some pressure up higher elevation, as we're now seeing it coming out, out the backside as well. So we can actually... On this image, zoom way in here, give you guys a little bit of a better view here, what that actually looks like. Right. It's the top of the cone right here. Maybe you can see the whole puka the vent right in here. Of course, there's another one with all the gas coming out over there. And there in the backside, you see the first uh, vestige of that lava flow peeking out behind the gas before it goes around the edge of this cone and wraps out and spreads out. So there it is right there. That there's an overflow that came and joined it. That's this guy. It came from the perched edge of the lava lake. That's all this stuff back in here. Um, one close in view and about as far as I got is not that far away. There, figure it out. I'll go back and just make sure we look at the caption here and we can see that USGS is giving us the information I'm, I'm sharing with you guys. In the morning of Tuesday, February 23rd, a new source of spatter appeared on a flank of the active western fissure within Hale Ma'u Ma'u at the summit of Kilauea. It started to feed a short lava flow down a spatter cone and onto the crested northwest margin of the lava lake. Field crew on Wednesday observed the flow to be active and captured this photo through the lens of a laser, laser rangefinder used to measure distances within the crater. The fresh silvery pahoehoe can be seen descending from the spatter cone to the left side of the frame. The flow is estimated to be several tons of meters or yards long at the time, though much, much of its extent of its extent was out of view on the backside of the cone. That's what that caption says. I'm just kind of trying to recap it and summarize it for you guys a little bit. Another image here, kind of zoomed in a little bit more, and you kind of see similar kind of thing. The flow was weakly active Wednesday afternoon, short distance. The northernmost event was producing occasional weak bursts of spatter, and that's what this image right here is looking at. So let's let's go into the closer in view and zoom in, and you guys can see there's a little burst of spatter. Hot on camera. Big telephoto lens at a big distance. Mahalo USGS for sharing that with all of us. 
So that's really what there is there. I can kind of pan around. There's not a whole lot. It's really the heart of the action of that photograph there. So we'll move on. I have a lot of stuff I want to share with you guys today. And here is a photograph of the terminus that ended a lot of flow. So in the lower right, you can kind of see a little bit of that active flow. Let me go into the zoomed in view here. And there in our zoomed in view, you can see there's some actual red lava. And then this Pahoy Hoy flows in this area don't look that dissimilar from what we see down on the coastal plain of Kilauea or in Kalapana area from the pool era of the eruption. That activity you have slow oozing flows, nothing, no giant torrents of lava flooding the area, right? It's not, not quite the same. This kind of maybe gives you, people who are from around here, more intu intuitive feel for how much lava is flowing out and how fast it's flowing out of there when you see these kind of pahoy hoya lobes and not a big lava river. I think that's kind of one thing we're trying to make sure we understand the context of here. All right. So here's a view uh, taken from um, the west of the whole lava lake. So you can see there's quite a lot of gas visible in the daytime. And maybe you see a little bit of that. If I click through to the original here. And zoom in, we can see that glowing hole at the top of that, that north part of that western vent right there. The edge of the lava lake right in there. So interesting. Um, not a whole lot new there that we haven't seen a whole lot of before. I am trying to look, and one thing we have seen reported, and it's not easy to see in many of these photographs yet, but I'm sure that will be some more forthcoming, is that apparently there's a lot more crumbling happening than a lot of these smaller islands that are here frozen on this back eastern, eastern part. So you're seeing there's a lot more talus and debris at the base of these things, right? And I'm kind of just illustrating where it would be. I don't really see any here as easily on this photograph. We did have a zoomed-in photograph of maybe it was this one over here, that, that this back corner over here had fallen off a couple of weeks ago. But that kind of thing seems to be happening more as you see more cooling and contraction and the cracks and the loss of integrity there. So that's interesting to, to think about and look for. And of course, we have also seen um, photographs of places like, if I can zoom in right in there, it's not at all where I click. Right in here, we can see that there is, even through the fume, we can see some rock fall from the crater's edge up here that came down on top of this solid lava crust, right? And there's still, there's still lava leaking out from this little crack, this little edge right in there. But not, but right in the interior of that, you can see that the, that whole thing is being lifted and lifting all that rubble with it. Right? Maybe if the rock falls right in the crack, it gets covered up. But if it falls farther away, then it has a lot less chance of that happening. Which is interesting, right? You think about how this thing is actually still erupt erupting, and we still have these kind of cooling process features uh, kind of starting to form some of the peripheries. Okay, so that's me from the west. And there's another view taken here from the south, which is really nice as well. And I will zoom into that as well. Here is our, our west vent to start. You can kind of see that we built up a little, little uh, cone, almost like a little hornito here at the top, right? And uh, uh, you can see this base of this lava flow coming out here, and the flow coming out the back, visible just at the beginning, right here. This photograph as it was taken right in here. This is a, during that activity. So let's scroll down. There's a more interesting thing here where the where the entry point is. You see the entry point is. Kind of flattish. We don't really see so much of a dome right now. And here is our heart island, not looking quite so heart shapeish, right? The heart shape is kind of like that now. It's kind of a little bit deformed. Um, but th but there it is. Uh, that's that that one bigger island that's been near the west vent, and a smaller one over here that's looking a little bit more teardrop shaped. I mean, maybe better candidate for part of the photograph award here. And you can see here some of the smaller islands. You can see how we pointed out in the thermal image a lot more. These are popping up and visible than were before. And that's visible in that thermal, I mean, in this visible image as well. Visible. visible. There's another one right in here. We're going around it there. All right, so then edge of the lava lake, you can kind of see that there's areas of the crust looks a little bit smoother and and frothier is maybe how I associate this te kind of texture and other places where it's still still um, getting recycled through that crystal foundering process here that's happening in this photograph right in here and look up here and see areas where the crust is, look, looks more crumbly or darker that must probably some of the older crust that's about to get uh, recycled back into the lava lake order and here at the far edge is the edge of that perch rim this is one of the great photograph we have here showing a lot of these different features 
And down here, I'll come down. We can see a little bit of the edge of this big island. This floating, not not recently floating, looking like it's parked and maybe just bobbing island. Right here it is, um, the edge of it over here. And I'll scroll back over here to the left, near past the edge of the edge of the crater we're looking past. Right, so there's all in the foreground here the pieces of the water rim that fell down. I scroll enough. Oh yeah, I thought I could find it. If I go down enough, I actually can find this piece of road. Look at it right here. There's still a little bit of a slab left right in there. You can kind of see it's crumbling at the edges and crumbling over here. And we still have some center line left right in there. I can get a little closer for you guys on that. Some couple pieces of it over here on the side. Look at that thing kind of just hovering, floating there. And you can imagine that as, as the ground is tilting and shaking and there's earthquakes, eventually this whole thing is going to crumble in. So. Cool thing to have caught, have caught at the edge of this view over here. But now I'm going to scroll back over here to the right and show you guys. I'm going to zoom out a little bit so you can see a little more clearly. There is a lava lake and there is that perched edge right in here. And so really on this, on this west side, we have this biggest gap, biggest gap between the edge of the lava lake and that crater right in there, right? And so if you guys are looking at this all, whole view of that whole zoomed in piece of road is right down in here. All right, I've probably scratched on this image enough here. And so that's gonna, that concludes the, the new imagery we have. Let's take a look at what this looks like uh, looks like on a monitoring data before we take some of the questions. And we, uh, we'll, we will cover uh, later today a little bit of Mauna Loa, which you know, um, has been more of a focus this week. And also we'll have a little bit more of an in-depth on, on a paper the USGS released on lava lake bubbles in 2015 and what we can learn from that and how, we can, how, how that gives us insights and um, into the differences between Hawaiian style eruptions and Stratemolian kind of eruptions, the role gas plays, how much gas, all that kind of thing. We won't go too too deep into it, but I will show you guys a little bit to peel back some of that that uh, uh, veil so you can understand a little bit more of the, the nuances and the level of detail that the scientists can can go into all this. All right, but before we get to that, we'll cover we'll we'll, we'll make sure we touch all the bases here. Information on Kilauea USGS HVO website. The last two days it has been going down. Um, you can kind of see two steps almost, right? An initial step, a stabilization, another little step. Small things. This first one was two microradians. The second one so far has been maybe four microradians. So together, five microradians, that's getting to the size of a deflation, regular deflation inflation event with just a little, little hitch in it for some complexity that's unknown to us below the ground out of sight. So zooming out here to the last week. You can kind of see here, we actually had a bigger deflation inflation uh, earlier in the week, came back up, and it was right in this area of the 23rd we're showing you guys, that, that little piece of the cone reactivating was right in there. And we saw that it was around the 22nd, we saw those islands emerge. So right in here, as the lava level, as the pressure goes down, and maybe the gas uh, the gas isn't in the lava as much, the, the lava is less gassy and more dense. Islands can float higher and become more exposed for the lava surface. So that happens somewhere in here. And then somewhere in here is where you see the pressure come back and then the lava squeezing out the top of that west vent over there. All right, so that's um, the past week. And we'll zoom out to the past month here and we'll see that we had that, that first one and then the second one with a little hitch here in the back that presumably we're going to flatten out and come back up here. And so it's interesting we have this kind of back to back deflation inflation here. We had another one of those earlier in the month. Inflation, inflation, kind of two back to back. And it's in fact, there was one before that. So this is the third one we have here in a row um, that, that has that pattern. All right, so interesting, interesting to, to, to think about that. And we look at the gas values here. Um, I'm going to show you guys now. I've, I've been showing you guys the, the gas plot since the beginning of the eruption that has that high peak of 50,000. I'm maybe, maybe going to switch now to show you guys this, just the past month here, the past month data uh, from the USGS website. And so it gives a little bit better resolution. So this is just the end of January to the end of February, more or less. And so our scale here on the left in tons per day, at the top it's 4,500, 4,500, and the bottom is actually zero right in here. So you can see our highest value was about 4,000, not quite a month ago, um, but mostly we've been, we had kind of values between 1,500 and 3,000 to 4,000 about a month ago. And then really since since then, we've been below that 2,000 threshold right down in there. 
So the most recent measurement at 1100 might be somewhere right in here. There's one more data point somewhere right in there. So I can kind of zoom into this for you guys. Right, and now remember that every one of these hash marks is 500 tons per day, 500, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 right in there. So I'm going to scroll over because I'm going to zoom in so you guys can see better. You can see that we were down at 600, 800 tons per day. This is that 1,100, 1,200, 1,100. So m many of our values, you know, even though right now we're back up to 1,100 over here, there's another, another point populating somewhere in here. We're still below that 1500 um, mark, and it's still relatively low with some fluctuations. I mean, interesting to see that maybe it's following, you know, we don't have as much data, but maybe it's doing some mirroring of the deflation inflation event. It's, we don't have really enough resolution. It's just kind of speculation at this point, but you, you, know, you, you might expect some of that given what we presented in the past about deflation inflation events and gas monitoring at the Halei Mount Lava Lake of 2008 to 18, where they did see those patterns of gas uh, fluctuations on a on the same time scale as deflation inflation events yeah so that's the gas and you kind of see there that same similar kind of pattern right it's not quite clear to me and i don't have enough data to really see say what the offset is or anything like that or really if it is a correlation there but or just some random variation but it, it's interesting to think about that maybe there is that kind of pattern if we were to have enough data to to see that so there's a past month there. Okay, and so I wanted to mention, I mean, this is a, something I showed in our two-month recap, but I, we recombined our more recent month over here on the right with a two-month image from the USGS during Volcano Awareness Month. So we can ha have a more continuous plot. So this is now a three-month tilt plot going back to before the eruption. The eruption begins right in here, part way in. You can kind of see we had that big drop, and we've had these fluctuations, you know, kind of a, a coming back up gently nowhere near the level of, of where we dropped from right but still kind of coming back up but with these kind of perturbations where we have a deflation event and then deflation inflation the first one there and then the second one here and then the third one is off the right it looks almost like a like an ekg right blip 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 interesting right a little bit yeah sounds like it's pouring rain down the danes yeah, I'm going to keep the mic muted for the most part because it is absolutely dumping down here. All right, yeah, and it's not where I am here. And that's inter interesting because we'll, we'll look at that here shortly as well, the, the effect of rain, you know, um, rain is, is something to worry about on our tilt meters as we have seen recently, right? So we'll look here at the other tilt meters around um, the volcano. Here is just a summit component without that green rift zone line, which we'll look at here when we separate it out. And you can kind of see the pattern um, a little bit more Clearly, with a plot with a scale from um, plus eight to minus 10, 18 micro radians, there you can kind of see that last week's, or last, sorry, last uh, few weeks ago, deflation, inflation, double it almost, and then kind of a gradual rising, and then deflation, inflation, deflation, inflation, double it again just within the last week here. Right, you can kind of see that pattern at Uikahuna on the northwest side of Caldera is mirrored at Sand Hill on the southwest, right? And one that necessarily copy it, but you can see that same pattern. One, two, one, two, again there. Kiloi Iki, again, you see those two tre trends. The escape road has never really shown that pattern, so no surprise to not see it there. Pu'o'o has from time to time shown those patterns, but we're not seeing anything like that on a Pu'o'o plots, whether we're, whether we're looking at POC or POO. That's these two plots right over here. And we're looking at POC, you can see like, okay, well, the biggest change here is on the order of 0.5 to 1.5 microradians, and it's been on the last two days here. And it's been a kind of big rising up here. And so in the last two days, what's happened? There's been a huge amount of rain. Amount of rain and perhaps localized in some areas, right? So maybe, you know, from one place to another, from from Leilani to Volcano Village, you see a, a, a gradient with different amounts of rain in different places. It might be spotty. So that is a suspect signal there that you want to make sure you looked at the weather before you said, okay, for sure it's only a volcanic or for sure it's only meteorological. So there is that. All right, if we look at the uh, POO station. That's this one right over here. And there's an interesting effect here because if we look at the scale, the scale on this one is massive compared to any of the other ones. We're actually, I'll read it to you guys, 20, 10, 0. So we have 10 micro radians between these marks. You can kind of see that since the 12th, two weeks ago, we have this kind of decline happening right over here with these, with these daily variations kind of superimposed on it. We can ignore those and average them out. We're going down 
somewhere like that. Right, so you can kind of see that we had an event similar to that, similar to uh, when we had rainfall last month, where it was really slipping and adjusting quite a bit. And here we have going from about 10 to close to minus 30, right, in the course of a couple of weeks. So it seems like the ground is still settling rapidly, quickly, and dramatically over there. Not that we know exactly the details, but the, there, are, there are some signals and instruments here showing us that there's quite a lot of settling happening at pool, right, still where the magma would believe reached and was stored underneath it um, and backfed into the summit for this eruption. And in contrast, further down at Jonica Station, the one that's closest to Highway 130, closest to the Lower East Rift Zone, um, is showing no effects whatsoever of anything at all. So good news for everyone in Lower Pune. Looking for our uh, looking for lava depth um, variations here, I'll zoom in. Within the last week, we've really kind of been hovering up and down. We haven't had enough lava coming in consistently enough, and it hasn't been gassy enough to really rise a level. Our peak was still last weekend. Today, we're close to it. We're only one meter below that. Um, we'll look at the numbers here from the USGS update shortly, but you can kind of see just visually on a, on a graph here, we've kind of gone down a little, up a little, down, up, a little bit down, a little bit up, a little bit down, a little some, bit up. Some exclamation points thrown in. Yeah, exclamation points right here. Yeah, this is when this is this, this is a great indication of when the, the winds are changing and blowing that steam and fume right in the path of that laser rangefinder. I was trying to measure that surface below that west vent over there. Yeah, the exclamation points means bad wind, bad conditions. <laughs> <laughs> right, very much. Um, all right, so that's the depth, and we'll look, look at the USGS text report here. This is the one from today, from this morning. And the numbers are 217 meters, 715 feet deep underneath the western active portion of the, the lava lake under the west vent. Emissions on the 25th, 1,100 tons per day. That's where that number is coming from. Everything I'm telling you guys is coming from this USGS HVO website information. Just trying to repackage it, repackage it um, combine it all, and synthesize it so you can just listen to one thing all in one place. Rather than do like what we do is go and look at these... 15 and 20 different web pages all at one all the time and try to figure out what's, what's changed from one iteration to the next. All right, so um, a lot more information here in the text updates. So I encourage you guys to go read that if you haven't ever done that before. Write a lot of information in there, but we will move on for our purposes today. Uh, there is less VOD coming out, um, but it's still circulating around the island. We want to make sure we keep documenting that human impact of the VOG as the main effect of this eruption on people. Um, besides, of course, a chance for us all, all to touch base and educate ourselves and learn about volcanoes. And the whole point of that is to build resilience within our community so that when something like this happens and it is in near, near communities, we can actually respond without having to ask of like, well, why is it happening here? And why is it happening like this? And, you know, why not? We'll have, we're, we've kind of, that's what we're covering all the time. Let's kind of make sure we have that, that basis to, to say, okay, well, now we can focus on the actual evacuations and the actual help and People with, with a, the, the needs that they have. So it's a little insight to where we're coming from there. So we all, I always want to make sure I mention this VOG impact, even though it's it's maybe minor in a grand scheme of things. It is the the main impact, human impact of this eruption with the with the wind blowing around the south part of the island into the Kona Kona uh, side of the island, really getting the worst effects of it for over two months now. Okay, and then finally, before we uh, take a pause here and address some of the questions and switch gears to Mauna Loa. We'll look at our earthquakes and we'll look at the earthquakes as far as Kilauea. There's not a whole lot happening in Kilauea Summit. Not a lot happening in Kilauea's East Rift. There is some minor activity on the south flank over here, central south flank. Um, there's still continuing action, deep action under the Pahala region where magma is coming into the volcano. So when magma supply is high, the volcanoes are not going to stop anytime soon. Um, but there is no correlation we can make to the surface from these deep earthquakes, apart from the fact that we know that there's still um, movement of magma deep, 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 deep down that feeds from this area over to this area and then up vertically within this area to feed the eruption we see today. Right, and also independently towards Mauna Loa, feeding up into that area, right, where we are seeing earthquakes in Mauna Loa. And they are a little bit elevated from from previous weeks, but they are still within the, the background patterns of uh, increasing activity we're experiencing now. So we'll continue on Mauna Loa and earthquakes uh, shortly afterwards. Um, one more time here, I wanted to make sure we mentioned that we are brought to you guys by Kaleos and Pahoa Village. 
offering dine-in service and takeout, innovative, inspired Hawaiian-inspired local cuisine. Um, and I'll pass it to Dane to really um, add more about Kaleos and um, switch us over to our questions that we got lined up over here. Right. It seems like the rain has gone away for this brief time, so I'm going to try and take advantage of it. Uh, yeah, Kaleos is really a, one of the top-notch places on the east side to go visit. Um, it really ties in uh, the Pahoa experience. There's very unique uh, and refined twists that they do on pretty uh, traditional and local cuisine. Uh, really quality stuff, competitive prices, indoor, outdoor dining, takeout, uh, quick turnaround, good customer service, yeah, uh, indoor seating uh, with the bar there, perfect stuff. Um, really good for the family. Uh, they used to do live music, don't do live music because of COVID right now. Um, try and do all the COVID responsible uh, precautions that need to be done. Um, really quality place, check them out if you come out uh, Pahola side, uh, lunch or dinner, open for both. And yeah, awesome. So with that, do want to get into questions. Want to thank first uh, Hawaii Tracker for helping making this possible. HawaiiTracker.com is the is a social media network where uh, we're tr or social media yeah social media network that we're trying to build that is community focused that gets uh, people more involved in helping each other. We main way you can help us right now is uh, like and subscribe, share this video. We don't have the marketing. Uh, for promotions like many organizations do. So we rely on people like you to share this content. It really helps us. Uh, second way to help out is go on hawaiitracker.com, become a member, uh, become a user there. Uh, that's where we post all of our information in chronological order, uh, easy to search through that way. And third, and form, uh, third is to maybe consider making a monetary don donation. We take uh, donations on hawaiitracker.com slash support. So with that, we do have some interesting questions. Um, Want to get into? Let's just start off right at the top. Um, Sue from YouTube asked, "Do you think the islands are broken bits of the cone or clumps of the crust that formed by the rain?" Um, so we're not talking about the the main island now, but the smaller ones that formed later. Um, also, why do the mobile ones seem to move towards the vent against the the flow? Yeah, great questions there. Let me see if I can get this thermal time lapse back on our screen here. Um, all right, there it is. So yeah, so uh, I believe uh, was it Sue was referring to these dark spots on our image over here at the bottom, right? That are kind of near this west vent over here. So this is where the lava is plunging into the lava lake. And uh, yeah. Um, it does seem quite likely that these are pieces of that of that cone that have broken off and have been pushed into the lake right you know if you if you watched our our two month compilation video of the eruption you know, there's a couple of clips in there where you see big chunks of this of the cone fall over and then it kind of block the lava channel and the lava kind of keeps flowing and pushing and gurgling around it and eventually dislodges it and pushes it clears it into the lake and so that's probably one of those, those couple of those islands right there big chunks of that cone that you know on that video looks like you know maybe like a you know like a small piece of rock or something but you gotta remember that cone is 100 feet high so those are 20 30 40 feet tall blocks that are falling over and dislodging and when you fall in the lava lava lake then certainly that could be the core of one of those islands for sure there's also the candidates of of other pieces of that bigger island that were that were it's basically the center from that initial fountaining of the north vent when there was was still falling into the pit into the water and an interaction of the lava and the water down there as well. And there's some of that. There's also the, the cones and the material that formed at the lower part of this western vent that was submerged within one day of the eruption already happening, but there was still some cinder and stuff down there as well. And so there's wherever it formed through that manner is a candidate, right? And most recently, like most of the time in the last two months, it's happened from the, from the west vent. So that is the most likely place, absolutely. So yeah, great question. Awesome. We have a $35 super chat from Gary Bryan on YouTube. He says, uh, really appreciate the updates. Uh, mahalo, Gary. Appreciate the you know super chat. It helps us out. So next question. 
I uh, so this one's more uh, vague, and we get this question a few times, and I think it'd be good for you to just uh, get it out there. Julie asks uh, on for Julie from Facebook asks, uh, would you consider doing an update on Mount Etna's current eruption? You know, I, I, it's it's something that I'm not an expert on. I'm not an expert on Etna. I have many friends who are m much more expert than I am on, on Etna. And uh, maybe you guys, maybe we could try to collaborate with those guys in the future. But, you know, um, my my specialty is really Kilauea and Hawaiian volcanoes in particular. And that's, you know, um, where, where I'm safe, so to speak, right? You know, um, where I can, I, I know what I'm talking about. And I could, I could do that kind of synthesis and more research and present you guys uh, some of these other topics. Does take more time. That's kind of the kind of thing we would do more so, you know, um, that we're exploring more so when we have downtime off of this eruption. So if Kilauea is erupting at the same time, it's a lot less likely we'll do Etna. But if Etna is the only thing happening, maybe we should give that a shot sometime. Yeah, Etna is going going off right now, and it's spectacular. The history is spectacular. The comparisons are spectacular. It is fascinating. Um, but really, that's the kind of thing where we need to get get some of you guys who are watching. You're the experts. You guys know who you are. Yeah, come let us know if you want to come come on and um, help us out with this. All right. We have a $5 super chat from Susan Reichel. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, great job, you guys. I'm learning so much. Uh, thank you for the super chat. Appreciate it. Uh, so diving into the next one. Yeah, we, we do get asked questions whenever there's a it's X volcano starts doing something and there's video of it to make comment on it. And there is... There's experts for each volcano that are, you know, so knowledgeable about each one, and they're so different than each other from each other. So I, I, I understand. I get it. Um, someday, someday, but I, I gotta study yeah. some more first before I, before I I'll feel qualified to even start talking about it. And I'm not saying I'm not, everything I say is perfect either. I do make my, my mistakes, you know, and so you just kind of do do the best you can here. All right. All right. So Stephen asks. Uh, or it says that the other day you suggested that the low SO2 was a good indicator of reduced activity. Is there any chance that uh, the magma and the pressure are getting locked in anywhere and building up or do, does it always get released? Yeah. So it's, it's really interesting that the difference between SO2 and CO2, right? Because SO2 is something that, that uh, stays dissolved in a magma until pretty shallow. So really we think of it as that kind of half mile threshold down um, as when, when a magma is rising to erupt, that's when it's releasing its SO2, right? So it can be stored deeper down than that and not be releasing SO2 and be stored and be kind of building up and, you know, um, locked in as you, as you put it, uh, Stephen. So, um, ab ab absolutely that, that could be the case, you know, um, the CO2 is an interesting thing, right? The CO2 is something that, that comes out of solution much, much deeper. And so that kind of bubbles out persistently and a magma, if it sits on the ground for, for longer before actually erupting, that means it's been losing CO2 perpetually. And then at some point the SO2 has got to try to catch up, but that means your ratio of CO2 to SO2 is lower. Than if it had come from deep down and just kept going all the way to the surface and come right up, right? And that's where the gas ratios are so important. And that's the one thing we had had reported to us by the USGS is that the CO2 SO2 ratios are actually low, indicating the magma has not come from very deep down, very fast. It's, it's something that's been sitting around for a while. So there may well be two things happening. It's possible you have this kind of shallow pocket that's been sitting around that's been erupting. And it's been pushed and pressurized from below from some other magma that still hasn't flushed its way through or hasn't actually physically connected to this other magma. It's just putting pressure by, by buoyantly rising, right? And one thing that I, that I was looking at, uh, uh, look, looking at these, these gas tapers today, right, is you essentially are looking at a situation where you have a magma chamber that's got some, some cross section that's pretty wide, like a big area. And it's going to basically have a funnel towards that nozzle where it's coming up. So if you have like a fairly low ascent of the magma and the bubbles across that whole, imagine an underground lava lake, if you will, right, inside the magma chamber, that whole area, and it's all funneling to one little nozzle, then the combined effect of all those little things rising just a little bit can be quite a lot up the nozzle because of the actual area that you're draining upwards, so to speak, right? So there's, you know, there's all kinds of dynamics in there that are really fascinating. 
And so it's, you know, who, who knows if these things are connected? We, we, we've shown, shown um, this kind of Cylindike image before. Maybe I can find it again where you have kind of different, different batches of magma coming into the volcano and they can push and interact and sometimes they can go way through each other and mix and sometimes they cannot touch each other and not mix. And that's just um, one of the fascinating, th fascinating things about it. So yeah, it's, it's interesting, you know, it's really interesting because the low SO2 does indicate that the magma that's tapping this particular eruption does seem to be in decline. But we do see the bigger GPS picture that kind of shows that extension of the caldera, which might indicate that maybe there is some batch coming from below, perhaps. Or perhaps it's the south flank pulling south and magma is filling more passively from below because there's space there. And that's happening independently of this eruption. You know, happening at the, at the summit, you know, independently as far as the magma itself. Because, of course, when you deflate the whole pressure in a volcano, then suddenly all the wiggly bits can adjust and wiggle around some more. And that includes the south flank, which is the thing that wiggles the most around here in the last few years. But yeah, great question. Uh, well, Steven. Right. All right. For the next one, I sent you a image for it. Um, Ready. It's the Pahala one. Okay. So Jared Wilson asks, uh, how has the rate of deep Pahala earthquakes changed over the many years. I can't seem to find a good plot. So this plot that I have sent Philip to pull up is from, oh my God, which tab is it? There it is. Weck and Thalen, 2015. Yes. Yes, yes, 2015. Right, I got it. Thalen. All right. Yeah, that one. <laughs> so yeah, uh, there, here it is. You know, uh, can, can kind of see at this upper left panel, this plot of the, they have areas that have more tremor and areas that have more earthquake tremor being a vibration and so the earthquakes not just not, not a not a simple just kind of pop and roll but it's like a a longer continuous tremor that goes on goes on um, extended and so you can kind of see here they've, they've plotted out the tremor in one area and caldera up here and down here in the bottom part is this plot that he's asking for right and so um okay covering, you need to bring that one up just a little bit kind of, Let's see what I can do here because I'm kind of covering covering it with my my shoulder here. Get out of the way. Zoom it. Yeah, <laughs> zoom. There you go. All right. So 2011 is over here on the left, and on the left is events per day, and we have 40 events per day at the top, 30, 20, 10, right in there. So you can see that episodically there are peaks where you have up to close to 40 events per day. This is back in 2011. 30 events per day, 2011 again, 2012, we got to 20 events per day, one, two, three, three times, 20 events per day in 2013, one, two, three times, in 2014, one, two, three times. This only goes to 2015 here on the right side, but this gives you an idea of how long this has been going on and why we kind of brush over it more these days is because it has been happening more so since 2012 than before, but really for since 2012, right? And that kind of, we weren't wondering before, is it, what does it actually mean? But it's kind of hard. It's hard to connect that to anything, apart from we have long-term, high, higher supply rate to to the volcanoes, right? And you know we have to wait for that to manifest on the surface. Kilauea itself was actually came back. The batch into Kilauea came in earlier. Was about two thousand and three, right? So it doesn't quite correspond to the Bahala tremor in any way. That's that's you know the, the Bahala tremor follows ten years afterwards, right? Um, that. That, so there's some kind of domino effect that happens, maybe it comes from the top up, then that induces the bottom to come and fill, and it kind of cascades that way, right? But we really don't know, we really don't know. And I did pull up this other image here, Dane, that, that I, you know, maybe we, we could, sh could stand to show more off on this cross-section over here of, of that idea of where these tremors are happening, right? So mm -hmm. um, down over here is this mantle plume zone, depth on the left here at kilometers 20, 40, 60. And we think that this is where the, the, the mantle plume is affecting that is basically moving through the crust, in whatever manner arrangement it is. That's where the deep tremor and those deep earthquakes are happening kind of right in there. And then we kind of look at this upper upper panel right in here. There's, let's see if I can zoom this in. You can actually see there's a, a line here, 20, 30, 40, right around, right around 30, right? Maybe a little bit less than 30. There's this line of earthquakes that marks the connection between that zone all the way to underneath. This is Kilauea, right up here, shallow part of Kilauea. So this seems to be a pathway that connects that deep Ahala that kind of goes in that manner right in there. And some parts don't 
have tremor, don't, don't have earthquakes as much, but you do see that in the images over here. So that's kind of what, what Bahala Zone is all about, as quick as we can make it. Right. We do have a $5 super chat on YouTube from the Curbside Choir. It says, uh, great channel. The Big Island is incredible. Uh, yes, it is. Thank you for that uh, super chat. So let's go ahead and do the uh, other image that I sent you. The question is, do you have any idea how the size of the current lake compares to the lake in 2018 before it drained and collapsed? Yes. Yes, we do. Here in, in black is this uh, outline of the 2008 to 18 lava lake. I'll try to highlight it over here in this yellowish right in there. And this pinkish salmon color is the current lava lake, which if you read the most recent USGS caption is about 900 meters end to end now, almost a full kilometer across edge to edge of the lava lake. So this one is way, way bigger now. Of course, that was right. kind of when it was all active. You can kind of compare it also now, this reddish part over here, that's where we have active lava on the surface now. So that's getting closer to the size of what we sustained 2008 to 18 over here. Right. Although obviously it was more oval before, and now, now it's that more crescent. So you would imagine if, if it closes in anymore, it probably would like to be an oval somewhere in that range like that, right? About that size and, sh and shape, something, you know, like that probably would be a reasonable oval oval right there if, it were, if I were to close off this lava lake arbitrarily. Mm -hmm. All right, let's do one more. Um, oh, looks like we have a... $5 super chat from Jared Wilson that just came through. He says, thanks for answering my question. Are the Pahala earthquakes suspected to be from the deep supply to both Mauna Loa and Kilauea or just Kilauea? Both Mauna Loa question attached. and Kilauea and Loihi offshore as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, we, we were kind of waiting more of this cutting edge research that we hear is ongoing that you could actually differentiate these earthquakes into discrete Mauna Loa sector kilauea sector Oe sector but i haven't seen that that information that i could share with you guys yet right all right thank you for the super chat uh this one's an interesting question um it started out like one we heard many times but kind of then kind of goes a different direction michael from youtube asks uh if holly mama were uh, completely fills will we still call the area by the same name is my understanding that the name Holy Mama refers to the crater itself? Well, uh, I am I am not the expert on names. You know, I know that right. for sure. You know, um, but I can tell you what I have learned from some of those experts who you know I will fill in for and, until they and can tell us better. Right? Um, that area, the, the place is called Hale Ma'u Ma'u, and it will be called Hale Ma'u Ma'u no matter how it changes, because it has been changing perpetually throughout all of human history and before that. So Hale Ma'u Ma'u has been a crater in the past, and it has been a lava lake, and it has been a crater again, and it has been a lava lake again, and it has been a crater again, and it has been a lava lake again, over and over and over again. And that's fine. And, you know, mm -hmm. um, there are other features that for come and go, and we obviously want to have other names to be more specific about that, right? You know, so that's why we term things like the Overlook Vent and the... Uh, West Vent or North Vent or 2020 Vent or the 74 Fisher. We have these other other descriptors that we use as well. And the other thing is just like seeing how slow the the state is when it comes to naming Fisher Eight, for instance. That you know, if it did did disappear, the the floor of the caldera would collapse again, and the lake would return before the naming process happened the state was able to com would yeah. be able to complete that naming process. Even if it was 20 to 30 years, it would still be, yeah. Um, yeah. Holy yeah. Mom, Mom. yeah. I mean, the, the state has had, has had issues and or maybe the better way to say is the community has not been, uh, you know, fully supportive of some of the names that the state has chosen in the past and the process they've gone through. So the state seems to be a lot more careful these days and how to do that and seems to defer to the community and kind of wants someone else to decide ahead of time. So they can just kind of come and formalize it at some point in time. That seems to be the pattern, pattern I've seen, right? And, you know, right. they haven't been forced into any, there hasn't been any ambiguity, right? There, there, are, there are reports that in the collapse of 1790, there were actually four different craters 
the bottom of the caldera. Now, if that were to happen, now you might have a you know which one of those is Hale Mount Mount Okay, well now you got me. I don't know. Uh, but if you only have one deep pit like we've had after 2018, that makes it easy. That's clearly still Hale Mount Mau. And you know, um, I don't you know. Otherwise, we might have to have a consultation with a cultural um, local experts. Um, who perhaps have have commented on us already, and I can I can you know um, bring some of that content forward, right? Um, right. Guys like Bobby Camara, who are, you know, live here in Volcano Village, who really um, are the ones, the experts in, in these names and the evolution of names and the old names, and are correcting the names on the map for the geographic names on a monthly basis and all those kind of things. Yeah, those are the guys that really really know and have you know have have collaborated with USGS scientists on names and all. Those are the guys ask about that but my money is on it's still holly momo yeah and just you know how hard it is to get you know if we were to call fisher eight ahu Lao from now on we both know how hard it would to get people to actually use that term as opposed to fisher eight or f8 at this point because it's become so ingrained that it becomes the de facto name um, yeah that 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 is that is the 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 drawback of just waiting for someone else to do it for you is that you, and so you end up with a name like fisher eight that you know well what happens when you have another set of fishers and there's a fisher number eight we're going to skip over eight like we skip over the 13th floor in, in elevators we're, and yeah, i already so know that we, we the we, mainland <laughs> yeah sorry go i already know yeah. the mainland news organization stories when they do that fisher eight active and everybody's like oh my yeah. god fisher eight's active it's like no 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 it'd be the next eruption, Fisher Eight. There, this is the uh, we have bad nomenclature. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so I'll for you guys just to discuss. We've discussed this a little bit before. It's a little bit of a tangent, right? But we need a, need a new way to number and name fishers, right? Not just in chronological order. Oh, this was one when we came out first, so it's one. This one came out second, so it's two. Like, you know, we, at some point it has to be like you know, because the, the problem was you'd have a fisher open up between four and five and connect to five, and what did you call it if it came out ninth? Was it five or nine? That kind of made it really confusing, right? So there's there's got to be a better way in a future quantifying, you know, the geography. Like you know, we're we're this far east from the from the origin, or this far west, you know. So we're right. one west, or two west, or three west, or you know, and we can say like a world we have continuously open between one and five east, or whatever. There's going to be yeah. some better way in the future. We're kind of just laid out there as an, as a very rough idea for now. Please, someone take it and do better. If if we were in yeah. charge, we would stop that. Yeah, I, I see why they did it that way, but it really got confusing when we got yeah. to 24 and 25 and yeah. we're sitting there arguing about what is and what is not a fisher. And then we started taking, you know, away fisher numbers at one point. Like, oh, no, no, we're, we're subtracting one, right? We're, we're taking away. That's, that wasn't fisher 16. This is fisher 16 now. So it, you know, un, you know, it got confusing at that point in time. Um, right. And, and James, we need more eruptions, so it's going to happen again. Right. James Turner has a five dollar super chat. Uh, in two thousand eighteen, the eruption began at the top of the volcano. However, however, after the magnitude four earthquake, the lava began to pour out of the vent. Do you uh, do you visualize the plumbing? Yeah, yeah. So uh, in two thousand eighteen, we had had uh, something like fifteen year buildup of magma pressure that had come into the volcano that had kind of built the the summit lava lake that had gone all the way to the to the east rift. And so when that that magnitude for earthquake initial one um broke that barrier, it was a result of a long, long, long process of of pressurization that actually caused it to happen. And so um that makes a difference different from what we have today. Um and let me see if I can get you a cross section on the screen here. Um, give me just a second to, to find that. And this. Zoom in on it for you guys here. But all right, here is one of the more accepted, you know, there's still some debate a little bit um uh but more accepted plumbing diagrams of the shallower parts of kilauea volcano shallower geologically right this is kilometers zero one two three four five six kilometers down below the surface so we have our main conduit right here and maybe not just a single one but you know an area that these dikes come up through all through here right we have a south caldera 
reservoir, that's our main magma chamber per se, right? The big one. We have a shallow one above it that we call a shallow chamber. That's the one that's tapping this eruption now, like that to the surface. And then we have a connector that goes to the east rift zone, like this. That goes to here. Here is pool. And so we actually had some kind of blockage in the system or constriction where maybe it wasn't fully nothing could get through, but what gets through is a lot less coming in that's when, than what's coming into this area. So most of it was coming up through here and popping up and flowing out, and it was flowing out of Pu'o'o for, in the end, 35 years. So that was a very pressurized system, and kind of that ongoing eruption was fed by that big batch of magma into this whole area that pressurized all of this, popped it out of the summit, so we had a lava lake and rifts on flow and lava flow down to the coast, and all that was enough to relieve pressure. We broke the pathway and went all the way down to the Lower East Rift Zone, way, 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 way over here. So that's the plumbing diagram. We have a $10 super chat from Dagny Degart. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, he was on the island in the 80s, just before Kilauea re reawakened. Uh, he was at the Overlook, hit with fumes, and had to run the car. Wow. He said, I'm no expert, but this seems like it's ready to blow. Three days later, it erupted. Yeah, yeah. So when, it, when, it, when the gas amounts are coming up that high, that's a big indication, right? And so um, it was gas that had run away. And that Overlook, where he, was, where he w went and visited, is the one that fell into the crater. And no one will ever stand there ever again. So you can count yourself among the, one of the lucky, lucky yeah. ones to have been there. Um, no one else is going there anymore. Yeah, that one's done. Yeah, and but then our, we have our gas, oh, sorry, values, go our gas values are going down. So I, you know that's why that's why I don't think it's about to blow. Right. Uh, Natasha has a five dollars super chat. No message. Uh, appreciate it. Both those super oh, chats. Uh, mahalo. Um, do you want to continue, and then we'll. Do some more questions? Okay, or? yeah, yeah. We don't have a huge amount of Mauna Loa. I am going to go a little, little, okay, perfect. A little bit in depth on the um, the, the, the bubble stuff, uh, but we can do that, and then we can wrap up here at the end, yeah. So we're going to go a little yeah. longer tonight for you guys. Uh, you guys, anyone needs an intermission, come here comes part two. Pause us and pick us back up. All right, but we do have questions again at the end that we'll, we'll, we'll take live. All right, so Mauna Loa. Um, Mauna Loa, most recent 24-hour webcam from the summit. You can kind of see there's still some snow up there and the cracks, right? There's a lot of rough s surface of lava flow down there. You can see the snow is kind of cum accumulated in that, and those kind of the, the, the wrinkles of the Pahoy Hoy crust up on Mauna Loa somewhere. So all quiet up there, visually. Looking at the past month of monitoring data, here's where the earthquakes have been. This is the summit caldera, not quite visible um, right in there. That. And there's like the south pit in here, his upper southwest rift area, and main caldera being the more active areas. A little bit over here in the northwest zone, not as much. This is, we think, more of the, the feeder zone, right? This is an area that magma seems to activate when it's building towards eruption. So that's been happening. It's been building, but building slowly and surely, slowly and surely in a super low gear for a long time. And so this is not unusual to see this pattern within the last year. Dane, uh, you want to... Mute yourself, do you mind? Oh, sorry. Let's get those frogs. All right, so uh, here is our plot for the last month here, earthquake rates in depth for the past month. So our on the left, we have earthquakes per day as our axis from 0 to 60 up here. So you can kind of see that about a week ago, we're peaking up at maybe 45, over 40 earthquakes per day for a couple of days in a row right in there. And kind of overall, we have this longer hump but over the course of a week, we really were, you know, we had more earthquakes than, than recently have uh, during a week. Okay, so um, uh, that's kind of the, the pattern. And so yeah, HBO has actually actually met and discussed this. They, they report in the Volcano Watch, which was about Mauna Loa this week as well. But before we get to that, I want to kind of scroll down here and just show you guys there's nothing unusual on the tilt plot for the last month. Now we'll go back to their past year monitoring data and show you guys earthquake rates. And so here we are. This is that last little peak we have on the right that hit 250 earthquakes per week, per week now on the left, our plot, right? So 250, this is the highest highest value we've had in the whole year. I mean, kind of see our previous peak within the last year was just under 200. You kind of see it, it's had a sawtooth pattern. It goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up. And so it's probably gonna come down. And 
more important is a threshold, the actual amount that it gets to. And so right here we're at 250 per week, right? And so what the U.S. just reported in Frank Trusdell's Volcano Awareness Month talk um, earlier, um, about a month ago now actually, right? Maybe exactly a month ago. Um, and also in a Volcano Watch is that you're looking for something like hundreds of earthquakes to thousands of earthquakes per day. Right, so certainly looking at the thousands per week, no matter what, which way you cut it. And we're not at the thousands. You know, 200 might might seem like a lot in a week 250, but we really need to be in the thousands to, for this to be kind of alert. And then we, it's got to be sustained at that level for some amount of time, right? So we look at the GPS. The GPS is for the last year, the cross caldera distance on Mauna Loa. You can kind of see that after that adjustment in October and kind of a recovery phase, we've since then been coming back up steeper than before right so it's interesting that we've done that but kind of the long-term trend does kind of put it right around in there so i want it interesting to see if we might see it kind of been turn over a little bit and pick up this previous long-term trend because you kind of have a long-term trend of a long-term adjustment happening and you have kind of shorter adjustments on the surface happening on top of that so the smaller variations may not be as meaningful except locally as this long-term trend Right, and that's kind of why, why you see when the U.S. just sees this kind of pattern, they're like, oh, nothing's changed. See this? They're like, oh, nothing's changed. Oh, nothing's changed. There's a long-term pattern. Hasn't changed. That's the, that's the real story there. Right, so um, as, far as, as far as the vertical motion, the ground it still is rising slowly, right? This is in meters here, so uh, centimeters. You can see that since January, the ground has actually risen about a centimeter up there at the top of Mauna Loa. So if you guys know how much the ground moves a centimeter is a lot. If, if your ground on your house moved a centimeter every month, you'd be in trouble, right? This is a lot of ground movement, but for a volcano, it's normal. It is something where if we didn't expect it to at some point erupt, you might say, well, it's going to happen sometime, but we know it's going to happen sometime already. It's not going to happen anytime very soon because we're not at those earthquake rates we need to happen, right? So with that, let me kind of turn to the volcano watch that was uh, unveiled this week, kind of following up on that talk when Mauna Loa up next by Frank Trusdell. And we'll go over this plot, this map here um, shortly, but I want to kind of scroll down here and just kind of read one paragraph out of here for you guys that kind of, to me, is the meat of this. Um, review of the data from 1984 can help put recent observations into perspective. An immediate precursor to the 1984, 1984 eruption was an abrupt increase in the number of small earthquakes and volcanic tremor. Hundreds to over a thousand earthquakes were recorded by HVO's seismic network each day. In the hours before the 1984 eruption, Seismic activity increased to the point that the astronomical telescopes on Mauna Kea, 42 kilometers or 26 miles away, could not be stabilized because of the constant ground vibration. All right, so that's that's how much the ground is going to be shaking. And it's not going to be like, is it going to erupt? It's going to be like, okay, guys, just a matter of time now. Just a matter of time now. Like, you know, we can't, everything's shaking. Everyone's going to, we'll be able to tell. And because we do have, better technology now and we can pick up more earthquakes than in the past you know we do see these much smaller variations than it could see in the past as well so that's kind of the take-home message a lot uh, of good info in there so if you guys are the volcano nerd variety go and check this out and you kind of see here um more of this detail in there that's that's the the part that i wanted to really bring out to you guys who are more worried about Low erupting um sooner than later all right so and then as far as the reason why we talk about Loa so much it's because when Loa erupts it's usually more threatening right you know um, there's a higher risk because of the nature of the flows so this is a plot showing you know Mauna Loa summits right over here Mauna Loa puts flows all the way out towards Hilo right in fact the bottom bottom Mauna Loa is something like this right doing a lot of HPP is actually um, so some of it actually if, you, if, you, if somewhere around the the, the Kiao, um dump area is the boundary right in there so Mauna Loa the way up and goes all the way here all of south point all the way up it kind of goes around hualai this blue line up here all the way to the coast around mauna kea and all the way to hilo right in there that's the boundary right in there so uh it can pull, flow out flow out of its northeast rift zone which it has done towards hilo you can put flows out of its southwest rift zone which it has done towards much of south kona and towards south point and it can put out flows out of its radial vents, which could happen kind of anywhere in this whole sector of the volcano over here, right? The most recent one being 
um, big flow towards a bay. Here. All right, so the numbers on here, these big numbers are, are the important part as far as the, the risk. These are typical values of how much magma comes out of the volcano during these times. So these are millions of cubic meters per day. So if we look at something like this radio event, 3 million cubic meters per day, um, although that first flow was a lot higher than that, that got all the way to the ocean in eight days. Right? That kind of, to put that in, in, in terms we've been discussing recently, meters per second, close to 35 meters per second, right? So we think that our eruption now might be, you know, the most recent we heard was four. I expect we're down to two or one at this point in time with the gas decreases we've seen. When we, this eruption began, it might have been around 60 or 70 cubic meters per day, uh, per, per, per second, right? And, you know, um, so that's about the range of what you what you would expect out of a radial vent, Mauna Loa, of which not, not just over here to the northwest, but also within Calicacoa Bay underwater so you know um, go check out check out more of that um, and we do have a video um, with the highlights of Frank Truesdale's talk from that volcano awareness month if you guys want to look at that and not watch uh, the full presentation which is also very much worth it if you want to, want to get more of the details all right so let me let me go over here to the, to the northeast so next six million so double what you see out of the radio vents so that's close to 70 million or 70 cubic meters per, per second that's about what our eruption in 2020 started off at, was about that amount, something like that. And that can sustain long flows that can get close to Hilo, but that takes it 280 days was the last flow that came um, close to Hilo. I believe that was 1880-81 flow right over here. All right, so um, certainly nothing to sneeze at. Big volumes, you know, 60, 70, even 35. When we're talking about Kilauea, it might be erupting now on an order of 1 to 2 or 4. The Pu'or era was all four long term, right? Maybe range between two to six. You might be more generous, right? Um, that's kind of the, the, the range of it. Now, the southwest rift zone here, Mauna Loa, is the biggest, most voluminous interruption with usually 12 million cubic meters per day. And that relates to about 140 cubic meters per second. So 140, right? That's now we're approaching numbers that we were seeing at the low end of. Ahu Ailaao, aka Fisher 8, and 2018 eruption, right? Which, with those values going up to, depending on how you count it, with the bubbles or without the bubbles, without the bubbles, you get up, up to perhaps as high as 500 cubic meters per second, right? With the bubbles, you might get up to 1,700 or higher above that cubic meters per second of lava coming out, right? So that's, you know, compared to ours now, one or two, it's piddly compared to what's coming out of Ahu Ailaao um, in Leilani Estates. Um, but because of this particular sector right here, um, with that over 100 cubic meters per second potential, right, or average, those flows can reach the ocean in a very short amount of time. Three hours to the ocean, 15 miles. There. Sometimes a little longer. 14 hours, 18 hours, 24 hours, four days. Four days because this flow apparently was split between part of it going down this way and part of it going down this way. It all goes down one direction and it can get there. This is kind of your end member case, right? This flow all went down to the west three hours. So that gives you some logistical issues. You really want people to be prepared for that before it happens because, you know, um, how much warning can you really give in three hours? And our main mode of transport vehicle on, this, on, the, on the road here, the road the highway gets cut off in multiple places and that really breaks separates this this uh, northern area of Kona to this southern area of South Point, right? You really can't get to this southern area unless you get to come around the Hilo side. And that might be one of the, uh, the most immediate consequences of something like this happening. Right down here in the south as well, three and a half hours, South Point, a little bit more, more than a day over here, this uh, eruption too. So that's why it's important that we can keep talking about Mauna Loa, even if it's not erupting anytime very soon. Um, we don't see signs of that, but because it's such a big risk, right, and people live all through here, um, that we would like to kind of keep it up an education campaign on Mauna Loa, more so than um, scare people that it's, it's going to blow, so to speak. Right? So that is all on Mauna Loa. So if there's any Mauna Loa particular questions, we can take them. Otherwise, I'm going to move on to the bubble, bubble stuff here. So jump in if you need to, Dane. All right. Nope, that's all for now. I will jump in if we need to. 
All right. So there's been all kinds of releases from USGS, and we've we've you know we haven't done them all necessarily in order, but this is one that one that's the more recent, the most recent one. Um, that's Chapter E of uh, this publication that they're putting out, Professional Paper uh, 1867, Chapter E. Right. So this is patterns of bubble bursting and weak explosive activity in active lava lake, Hale Mount Kilauea, 2015. Right, so I'll, I'll talk to the, I'll talk about this a little bit. We have some videos to show you guys here as well. So um, this is by Bianca Mintz, Bruce, Bruce Hufton, and many colleagues, including USGS, uh, UH Manoa. Looks like some uh, Italian um, colleagues as well. Um, so we'll we'll see their their names come up here. Version report 18, 1867. So I won't go through like the whole text of the paper, but I will show you guys this, and maybe I can make this a little bit bigger for you guys to see. They're looking at uh, the ways that bubbles burst within a lava lake in 2015. And they separated this into, into basically isolated events. So one bubble comes up and bursts. And you kind of see here in a map where this happens, right? So um, in this particular plot, how long that lasts in seconds, one bubble bubble burst lasting only a couple of seconds is blue. If it lasts like a 20 second burst of a slug of gas coming up, that's in red. So you can see mostly it's blues and kind of all over the whole crust. Maybe some concentrations here at the margin a little bit. Right on this lava lake. They also can see how often they happen per hour, and you can kind of see that they happen less than 10 per hour most of the time, except you might have in this greenish 20 to 30 an hour, maybe along that kind of edge right there as well. It's a little bit of a border zone in there. Isolated events. Next event clusters, where you kind of see a whole bunch kind of together, right? That's the clusters. And here, the duration in section goes up, goes up to 500, so a lot longer duration. Right, you kind of see that we're in a minute and a half, minute to two minute range, right? And one of these is getting close to, to what is that? Eight minutes or more. So that's a spot right over here. But otherwise, you can kind of see kind of bubbling up. I'm trying not to go into too, too much more detail than that here. Cluster is happening here, frequency. There's a plot. You do get more activity in the edges in all the cases here, and then kind of more weak, weak in the middle. So that's one part of it here. Um, there's a third category, which they're calling prolonged events. And really, the prolonged events are putting out most of the gas, most of the lava spatter, and most of the stuff as well. And they last the longest, and they're some of the more interesting ones. So you actually can see that. Let, let me see if I can show you guys here the, 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 the scale first explanation, right? So the arrow is a travel path direction or expansion of the bubbles with origin as a circle. And then duration, purplish and blue from you know one minute to 10 minutes, and then the reddish four hours or more here at the bottom, right? So for example, when you look at, at some of these things, you can kind of see, oh, this was a quick one and it went over here, then it stopped. Quick one and stopped, quick one and stopped. Or this one actually went both directions, right? Kind of from, from the edge. And these ones migrated all the way to the edge of the lava lake over here, right? So this is kind of some of the real technical detail that you can kind of, people have done to try to quantify some of the dynamics of what the gas is really doing in there. It kind of takes getting this detail oriented to really kind of pull out some of the physics of it, which we'll show you guys here shortly as well, right? So kind of that's that's kind of the the I don't know what they got there. And let me see if I can find here some of these videos, right? So here's a video. I won't play the whole thing, but I'll play. Let me play a little bit of it here. This is maybe I can see language as well. I'm sorry, the speed playback speed speed up a little bit. So this is the, the, the HM camera that was pointing at Lava, 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 Lava Lake, 2015, April 24th. You can kind of see the circulation, the lava's rising in one area, it goes and it sinks in other areas, it changes directions once in a while. Right, so this is kind of, this is not 2018, you know, um, this is back to 2015, just to kind of clarify. Not the current eruption, but the insight that we needed to learn into the, learn about these bubbles of gas. So I'll kind of grab grab my slider here and drag it much much more quickly. You guys can see lots of different changes here. I can come back to this a little later when we're answering some more questions. That's the, the that visible camera. And we also have a thermal camera version of that as well. Play a little bit of that, the thermal camera version of that. You kind of see how these hot spots pop up in some of the sides and they migrate one way or the other. That yeah. So that's what we're talking about here. So this is this is cool because you know uh, the USGS webcams are recording images every minute and this time lapse is made from the image every, every minute which is not always sent to the to the webcam and webcam gets it every 15 minutes or so right but there actually is more uh there is finer resolution data minute by minute and here's an example of that released as part of this study part of this paper as well right so kind of there and 
anything kind of back and forth. Kind of just circulation patterns and tracking the bubbles to try to gain insight from that. Put that one away. Let me put that one away as well. And let me show you guys some of these some examples of this. So video one. Video one is an isolated bubble burst. Let's see what an isolated burst looks like. They're quantifying here. And one bubble right over here at the edge. You can kind of see that they're using um, high-speed photography and capturing a lot of frames and you know, basically being able to watch this in slow motion. And that's kind of what it takes to really quantify the things they're trying to figure out, like how much volume and how much mass was in that bubble. All right? These are things that these guys are pulling out of the details. I'm not going to go into that, but that is in here. Let me show you guys another one of these videos here. This one, their video two, is a prolonged episode of bubble bursting along the north edge. So you can kind of see what a prolonged burst looks like. A kind of consistent activity, just kind of gurgling, 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 often right near that edge of the crater right in there. You can kind of see that prolonged activity happening there. All right, so that's kind of some, you know, a couple of inverters. There's a couple more videos that will maybe save for some other time. Um, they're not, not a whole lot different there. So, but uh, here's what I wanted to show you guys. Uh, collectively, the activity, explosion activity accompanying the three styles expands and increases from impulsive, transient to sustained. So really, the prolonged episodes are the ones that give you the more information and more sustained discharge. So that's kind of the all the text I'm going to show you guys there. And I will move on to um, go back to this previous plot by, by the second author, Bruce Houghton. Um, and you can kind of see what they've done here is they've actually plotted on one axis on the left, the mass how much stuff is being erupted at once and on a on the bottom you have duration in seconds right and this is a, a log scale appears yeah uh, yeah so so um you can kind of see here what they've shown is they've 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 drawn um lots of different points on here and this is basically all the hawaiian style eruptions wh whether it be fountaining um or transient explosions over here, um, or the more, I'm sorry, this, this, this is a Kilauea fountaining over here, and some Etna fountaining over here in these kind of darker circles over here. And over here we have more of these transient explosions, um, from Stromboli in particular, Stromboli, Yasur, whatever else. And they're trying to, trying to differentiate between the Hawaiian style and the Strombolian style. And they're basically pointing out that there's a big there's a boundary at around 300 seconds, around five minutes, a five minute interval. So if the thing is lasting more than five minutes, it's one style of eruption. If it's less than, la less than that, it's a different style of eruption. And you kind of saw this gap in here, right? And so uh, what this study puts out was actually that this prolonged episodes are filling a gap. So this is a, an another manner. It's a kind of a different style of eruption. We don't really think of as an eruption, but it's putting out similar right in between amounts of gas and solid. So that's interesting. It's kind of bridging a gap there. That's kind of where this is leading us, this bubble study. They kind of bring it more relevant here to, to what we're seeing at the surface, right? This is like a model from uh, Vernuel and Mangan 2000 um, showing, in this case, a big slug, big bubble slug coming up. And that would lead to more of this Strombolian um, episodic firework style eruptions rather than a continuous fountain of lava coming up. And I, I like this one because it actually shows all the different things going on. We talk about we talk about how we can actually have different gas phases coming out, whether it's the water phase, the steam, and the CO2 or SO2 separately. Um, so it shows that. It kind of shows here within a magma chamber that you're having information above the magma chamber right here, seismicity with these little, little plus signs in here, and swelling of the chamber. You have crystallization. You have a foam layer up here at the top of this. You might have this convection happening. Bubble is rising. Crystals uh, falling and all that above the however the input comes in, right? You know, you might have a more a narrower to a wider to a narrower spot. That's kind of what we're, what we're imagining in here. So you might have a crystallization zone at the bottom as well. So all cool things about what's happening inside the volcano um, for our in-depth section here. And kind of to close it off here, show you guys some of these these studies, uh, these uh, experiments these guys have done, uh, Vernial as well and. Mangan in the same paper, they've actually uh, used low viscosity, low viscosity oil 
you're in, you have like a little bubble feeder coming into this this uh, plexiglass tank that can kind of clamp down here in the edges, right? And can they have this magma chamber down here that they can put certain amounts of gas into, and then they have like a conduit. They can kind of see how the bubbles rise up this conduit. And so in this case here on the left, this is the Hawaiian style eruption where you have bubbles coming up kind of continuously. Like lots of small bubbles kind of continuously all the time. That's kind of what we deal with here in Hawaii most of the time. That's what, why we have bubbling lava lakes and gas plumes that are constant and not just like smoke signals, like one puff and another puff and another puff and another puff. And neither, neither do we have just constant like um, gas um, flares as well, right? So this case over here on the right is uh, uh, one of those um, more unusual cases. So I'll switch over here to this one over here. That's the, the Stromboli analysis where you can kind of see that if they change the viscosity of what kind of oil they use and the input of how much bubbles they put in, now you have not only these little bubbles coming around, coming up continuously, but you also have these bigger nucleations of bubbles that come up as well. So that can explain why you might have, for example, deflation inflation events like this kind of process. You have kind of a continuous gas coming out, but you have other areas where you might bottleneck these things, especially if you start changing and flaring the vent shape. Right, and you know you want to get the gas out of there, but you got to get some of that dense magma out of the way first, drain out of there, so the gas can rise up and past it. And that's an interesting thing to think about here, and that's what these kind of these models really point us towards. And one last thing, based on actually doing these kind of models and looking at the oscillations that occur, they've actually found that different different oscillations oscillations off the bubble nose seem to come in at around two hertz bubbles. Uh, coming to the free surface and vibrating on a bubble surface seem to come in at around nine hertz, and then the bubble bottom oscillations, like you actually have the top of top of it's burst out and you're having some effect on the sides and the bottom over here, that comes in at around four and a half hertz. So it turns out that you can look at the tremor of these eruptions, and here's an example from Pool or Fire Fountain, um, and you can kind of see down here in the bottom frequency in hertz, you actually have. Right, this is that one kind of bubble bursting, and here's that other kind of bubble bursting, and here's that other kind of bubble bursting over here. Right, so all these different effects are something that we can, you know, we talk about just oh, there's trimmer, there's not trimmer, it's higher and lower. You know, with more information to be able to pull out these different frequencies, right? You could actually say, oh, look, it looks like it's this kind of thing happening in the ground, that kind of thing happening in the ground. So we kind of gloss over a lot of details here a lot of the time, but once in a while, I like to kind of, you know, peel back the curtain and kind of expose a little bit of the the details and how fine tuned the science can get in some of these these. These details. So I'll leave it at that. I won't go any further and won't, you know, hopefully I haven't lost too many or anyone. Um, but, you know, um, no worries if that's kind of um, just an interesting side note that, you know, you can look at things like seismographs and the frequencies and try to tell what kind of bubble action is happening out of sight down there. Chad is uh, commenting on your diagram of the advanced science of a lava lamp. <laughs> so yeah, pretty much. Like. I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, it's you know, I mean, there's, there's, there's all kinds of geologists who have careers and playing with corn syrup because you can, you can use corn, you can heat it, you actually can simulate viscous uh, fluid movements, and you, it actually takes colored dye, so you can actually put tracers in it and trace where the things. Are. So yeah, there's all kinds of yeah. you know of, of high tech science per se that might might be dealing with this corn syrup or you know vegetable oils or lava lamps yeah yeah do the yeah the dueling lava lamps that's what it looks like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right um so yeah you ready for some more questions then yeah one last round of questions before we all wrap right it up here so before getting into that i do want to go down the list of uh we've had some a uh, bunch of donations on hawaiitracker.com on the hawaiitracker.com slash support want to give a shout out to them. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, Lori H, Brian B, Marianne M, Susan E, Denise J, Elizabeth W, Jessica N, Robert G. And those are all monthlies. Um, also Jan R, S uh, W uh, with the monthly. Those are reoccurring uh, donations that kind of like a subscription that really help us keep going when uh, times are quiet. Uh, we also have a donation from Christopher N, and Keith B, Patty O, and Sue D. Uh, appreciate all you guys. Um, you kind of that really helps us keep going. All right, so let's dive into some more questions. Um, we do have one from Christina Anderson. 
say uh, Christina watched Truesdale's presentation on Mauna Loa. He said something like 50% of the eruptions stay in the summit area. Uh, from looking at the present earthquake activity, would you summarize that if it were to blow that this eruption would stay at the summit? Is there, if there were to be a rift zone eruption, wouldn't you see more quakes in the rift than at the summit? Asking for a few thousand that live in the Southwest rift zone with her. Yeah, so it's, that's a great question. You know, um, it's, th there's definitely a pattern that you see there that is rarely broken, that most of the time you have a summit eruption before you have a rift event. Now, how much ahead of time, that varies a lot. It could be as much as a year. It could be as much as a few, as, few, as little as a few hours. Um, we're mm. not seeing activity in the rift zones right now, but it seems more likely to me that you'd have a summit eruption first, and then as soon as that were to happen, now you're looking for where those earthquakes are moving down which rift. And at that point in time, can you really say, okay, it's the southwest rift, or it's the northeast rift, or it's neither rift, or that's not happening, right? Um, right. So that could that could be a whole year long process, but there is of course that biggest fear I understand the concern there because it could be as little as a few hours, right? And maybe in that case we might see you know more signs of instability in the flanks, GPS motions of the flank, or that kind of thing. We we have more instrumentation now than we had in the past to try to kind of pick apart. Even if it's something's funny is happening at eight thousand feet, what's what can we learn about that? Then let's look at the insert. We have satellites flying overhead now, so that's going to be a huge a huge component right we actually can can produce satellite satellite difference of topography images weekly they're not publicly you know, there's a lot, a lot a lot of processing power and they're not publicly put out right because there's a lot of um caveats and you know um sources of error you gotta gotta account for but that's that's something that if we were looking at my little building up would look at that happening on a weekly basis as well so right. long term i you know we, we don't we don't know that it, we can't exclude the southwest rift and that's why it makes it one of the more hazardous areas volcanically to live, right? You know, um, there's other kind of hazards besides, besides volcanoes, you know, but volcanic is what we're talking about here. And um, yeah, you might think that you might see more quicks in the, rif in the rifts at some point if it was going to go into the rifts. We do not see that at this point yet, right? Does that preclude it happening after the <coughs> eruption when it happens? Right. Next? And one of the reasons <clears throat> we don't usually try and hype up Mauna Loa, even we talk about it, we do reviews on it, but we try not to uh, hype it up because we do expect the next eruption to take place inside the summit, inside the caldera. And then uh, you get to a point where the, you've, you've gone into the sequence, right? If you're trying to get to a rift zone eruption on the Southwest Rift, you need that pre prerequisite uh, summit eruption. But then you can have a long period between those phases, right? It's not one and then the immediately step to the next progression into two. You can have downtime in there. So when we're waiting into waiting for the summit eruption, it's kind of more chill out than if we already had the summit eruption and we're monitoring it then. And we already seen for COVID how hard it is to, you know, keep a prolonged sense of uh, awareness up in a population uh you know comes that thing like well you're the boy that cried wolf so when we're truly trying to save it for when that uh, time is uh, more precious right uh, say we do have a some a summon eruption and we have months on afterwards without any activity those are the months where we have to keep people really prepared and aware of what the activity is on mauna loa yeah, great point. Yeah, yeah, we're not we're not into that next gear yet, and so yeah, we uh, right. It, it, we do expect that we'll be talking about this in the future, but um, it's not an imminent concern now, right? Now, if it's the kind of thing that worries you long term, then you know now is a great time to take steps to change that situation. Right. We have a five dollar super chat from Brenda. Um, no comment. Really appreciate it. Thank you for the super chat. Oh, a lot of those today, so, Thank you guys. Mahalo, mahalo. Yeah. So Jared asks, uh, can the get going into your DI events? You kind of touched upon this, but uh, already. But you know, let's do it. Can DI events be seen as a kind of a large bubble rising to the surface and bursting? Obviously, obviously over a much larger scale than the uh, models you were showing. Absolutely, that's kind of how I imagine it, right? You imagine this kind of two-phase flow model where you have. You know, one one pathway that's kind of split, and you have gas trying to rise up one side of it, and you have that 
dense lava trying to drain back down the other side and then at some point when you clear as a pathway then you can re resume the regular supply of that fresh or gas your lava to the top yeah so yeah the bubble bubble rising up but co combined mm -hmm. with we think some you know like we gotta you gotta take the dense stuff from above and put it down and less dense stuff from below and put it up and so you gotta get the bubble up and the, the dense magma down and you've accomplished your your mechanism yeah absolutely awesome Randy asks uh, if the eruption or when the eruption stops, is it possible for the lava lake to solidify without draining? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think that's the more likely thing. In fact, you know, we we expect to see the sagging of the crustal surface, right? Even possibly, you know, more so on one side than the other because it's hotter in one area more than uh, it's hard to tell exactly. I imagine it probably is liquid and gooey underneath the entire entire crust. You know, um, I'm not sure like how much circulation we have beneath the crust on the eastern eastern side partly because we have the island that main bobbing island kind of, kind of whatever route it has possibly blocking some of the flow that goes across that way so you might swirl it more right you know, that might might allow you to have little edges that don't quite flow as much but it's certainly all liquid still and kind of cooling but yeah i expect it probably will, will not drain and solidify mostly and have a cracked, sunken surface because of the cooling and degassing, even as it's cooling, you know, for, you know, for decades or whatever else. And before decades right. go by, we'll have another crack nearby and lava will pour down and make another layer of glaze over top of this one. Right. And all the dynamics of that. Um, the, really, that's the real thing to me is the, the idea that it's just going to sit there and cool for multiple decades is the most unlikely scenario that I can think of about up there. Um, the idea that, oh, yeah, it stops for a few decades and the thing cools. Oh, no. Oh, no. There's going to be action in there. Um, guarantee there's going to be action over the next few decades in there. Something could cover it or it could actually crack and drain out of the gooey middle into a lower pit. Or who knows? Both of those things have happened in the past. All right. Definitely. So uh, last question I got lined up for you here is from Great Dane Lovers on YouTube. Great name. Um, how much of the cone-shaped liquid... How much of the cone-shaped liquid lava lake is estimated to still be in a liquid state? Uh, the, the, the interior of the deep cone shape of the lake. So you're saying the vast majority of it you still think is liquid? I imagine the vast majority is, is liquid, yeah. If we look at the, kind of the, the USGS, I don't, didn't have, I don't have it. I can find it up here again, our Kilauea cross-section. That's I should have it here every time. Um, but uh, uh, in Kilauea, we found that the crust was was cooling, maybe in a matter of feet per a few feet per year kind of thing, right? So I mean, it's it's not that fast um, to the point where it, it, there probably is some solidification happening, but it might be on an order of inches to a foot, maybe at this point, at most. Um, and possibly not even that, you know, um, until the actual input stops coming in and you can, you can really cool it off a lot more quickly. Like once the lava stops coming in and all the gas starts venting out of there, taking away heat from there as well, it's going to cool way faster than now. And that's when most of the, most of the, it's going to accelerate, accelerate and cool from the edges. So there's probably some effect. We certainly see there's a crust on the surface. It's probably, you know, that's has some thickness. So what's happening at the bottom of that crust? Is it kind of getting thicker and thicker and thicker? Or is it just kind of bobbing and floating up? But we, we don't know. So great things to think about. Um, mm -hmm. It's, you know, I imagine it probably is still a cone-shaped lava goo, right? That has, like, one part of it that's hotter and circulating um, more so where it's, where it's coming in. But especially because we see the squeeze ups coming up the outside of the ring of the, the whole crust um, it does lead me to believe that there is at least some flow moving all the way underneath all the crust everywhere. But we're really all right. Well, that does it for me on the question front. Uh, appreciate everybody that stopped by and hung out with us in both the chat rooms on Facebook and uh, YouTube. Uh, we are brought to you by Hawaii Tracker one last time. Uh, come check out HawaiiTracker.com. We just pushed a big new patch, a bunch of new options for content creators trying to create a uh, platform that empowers creators to be able to share and monetize their uh, content without uh, you know, a company taking all their profits from them. So we're trying to you know make that happen. Uh, come check out. Come check it out. All right. 
thank you, everybody. And off yeah. to you, Phil. Mahalo, Dan. Yeah, for sure. Definitely like to support local. And yeah, I just want to mention one more time, Kaleos. Mahalo for support. Kaleos, but you got Kaleos as well. And that's one thing, one thing we're trying to make sure we, we support our, our local community with these with this uh, revenue that everything that comes in rather than, you know, having a less uh, local entity, you know, managing what really should be, a, you know, a, a tool for our local communities, right? And not only that, like, you know, if we're talking about, talking about resiliency, we want to make sure that we can withstand any changes from any external forces that, you know, suddenly, suddenly decide to not start showing news here or there or whatever else, and we were not going to have to deal with that. We can make sure that our information lines are open in case of emergency, and that's really our whole MO. Yep, trying to get away from that clickbait style of reporting on uh, the volcano. Um, it's our way of, you know, trying to help out. Yeah, no fridge-sized refrigerator is being hurled out of the volcano today. Yeah, yeah, not today. Maybe tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow. Um, <laughs> All right, mahalo, guys. It's been a been a, a long stream here for you guys. Uh, thanks for joining us. Mahalo, Dane. Mahalo, Hawaii Tracker. Um, so we'll see you guys once again on Tuesday next week. Uh, we're now doing our live volcano streams on Tuesday and Friday evenings, 5 p.m. in Hawaiian time. Um, if something else happens in the meantime or some other topics come up, we'll, we'll cut in and do some other other updates and posts and that kind of thing as well. So uh, check it out. Keep track of us on hawaiitracker.com in between of our updates. So for Dan DuPont, I'm Philip Ong. Mahalo e aloha. <laughs>